What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an amazing conference with some of the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders, including Excelco, who will be there. Um, now today, I'm very excited. We have Ray Nolan. He's one of Ireland's most successful internet entrepreneurs. Ray founded Raven Computing, later known as Core Time, in 1989. Seriously, a pioneer of uh, software and SaaS. Core Time was sold to Sage in 2004. In 1999, he founded the hugely successful online room reservation group, HostelWorld.com. There's a really amazing story about how they acquired the domain Hostel.com. It was leading worldwide brand with distribution contracts in 170 countries, more than 12 million visitors a month. They sold it in November of 2009, returning more than 500 million on a $150,000 total investment. He's former chairman of Skyscanner. If that wasn't enough, he is founded as acting CEO of Excel Co. Software. They provide market-leading e-commerce SaaS tools. Ray, thanks for joining me. Hey, Jeremy. How are you? All the way from Dublin. Yeah. So, Ray, tell me, Excel Co., what is going on now at Excel Co.? So Excelco make a range of tools for marketplace sellers. So if you sell on your own website, we, we have a great tool which allows you to do your help desk. So all your all your incoming email and queries get responded to. But instead of it being a sort of a ticket management system, we also hook into your software and produce and show your order beside the incoming inquiry. So for example, the order for shoes that you say didn't arrive, the agent doesn't just get the email, they'll see also the order and they'll see your delivery history and they'll see the picture of the product and even the picture of the person's home. Hmm. Um, but I think that what where we really sort of our our hot point is where when you get into multi-channel because with mm. multi-channel you've got you know you've got inquiries and orders coming in from let's say multiple Amazon markets some eBay markets maybe Alibaba maybe Walmart maybe Fnac you know many international areas and typically people will have to log into those those tools to answer their problems so. I've got to log into the Amazon Seller Central. I've got to answer my problems there. I've got to answer the queries, the pre-sale queries. And if I don't answer those queries, my ratings drop. If my ratings drop, I make less sales. 100%. And so what we do is we collect all of those incoming pre- and post-sale queries, put them in one dashboard, allow you to distribute them around your team, around, allow your team to pick up those um, and reply. And we basically use the APIs. We connect to those platforms and deliver your messages yeah. straight to your to your customer via those channels, ensuring, I guess, that you get your answers back quickly and that your ratings stay high. Yeah. It's simple as that. What trends are you seeing in e-commerce as far as what, you know, it's obviously multi-channel. What platform should people be getting on if they aren't already or maybe you're seeing the results aren't as good as you thought on certain platforms? Well, I mean, I think everybody knows Amazon are killing it. So, you know, yeah. if you're not Amazon, you, you should be. <laughs> uh, but I think that, you know, I'm seeing so many new entrants in the uh, starting as quasi platforms. You know, um, you see even Shopify do a deal with Amazon, whereby you're, if you have your own Shopify store, you can now sell on Amazon. Yeah. Other states. Um, you're seeing Fnac in France. You're seeing big platforms in 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 Poland. You're seeing other platforms in Europe. There are a lot a lot of people trying that platform play. Uh, and then you've got traditional retailers like Walmart. Who are who are taking their existing supplier base and saying, "Hey, come sell on our platform." Um, you know, it's 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 logical for them to do so. Uh, yeah. Like the, you know, Amazon have blazed the trail, and and you know, FBA fulfillment by Amazon is a, is a sort of the way they do. It. I guess if I'm selling via Walmart, and I'm and I, I think of an FBW uh, fulfilled by Walmart, has got to be in their future because I'm shipping my product to their warehouses. And if they're shipping them out of there, then all good for me. So, right. You know, 
it's it's a it's I think the problem for online sellers is the number of platforms and having to choose ones that suit them, right? Ones that bring them the kind of customer they want, uh, and that's a challenge. I mean, you know, it's 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 a kind of case of you could spend all your time listing everywhere, and if it's very easy right. to list the product, then right. go for it. Yeah, but you got to make sure that you can maintain a high level of support in there and that you're getting you know profit on every item yeah. you sell. I ask you that specifically, Ray, because you have been um, you know doing my research. You are early to the game in a lot of respects, in a lot of uh, SaaS and software, sometimes mm -hmm. too early in some cases. So I'm wondering what you see as um, an up and coming platform that maybe people aren't on now, but you may see get bigger in the future. You know, obviously there's the Walmart and the Amazon. Are there any other smaller ones that you see taking over? I think it's more, it's more European at this stage in terms of the like the FNAC and so on in, in France and localized mm -hmm. stuff. So I guess if you're if you're if you you're US centric, you know, you've got Etsy making plays over there. You've got, you know, but it depends on the kind of product that you sell. If mm -hmm. you sell a generic, you know, USB product, then maybe Etsy isn't there for you. Right. Uh, so but I think, you know, you've got to be aware of the time it takes you to get set up with these guys and what your what your likely sales are going to be. And you know, it, it doesn't cost much to try a lot of them. But I think you know you you got to do your research and you got to make sure that you know how technically competent is this channel. There there are still mm -hmm. channels whose 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 technology itself isn't isn't necessarily great. So you know are you going to have to log in or are you going to have to reply by email to a to a query? Can you can you see the customer's details? Can you mail that customer? I mean owning the customer is a great thing. I like to own the customer. Right. So there's a chance to get directly to the customer. You know. Um, that would be nice. Yeah. So some channels would let you do that. Some won't. Most won't. Yeah. So Ray, take me back to the idea of Excelco. Oh, okay. When well, you so, first started, what was the original idea before you actually launched it? Yeah, it's, it's uh, that's a hard question because I have to tell you some bad things. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. So so what happened was I got invited. So I've had a number of of e-commerce things. Uh, Right back to the, I mean, the second SaaS product ever written, I think, was CoreTime.com, which was a time and billing product written straight off. I mean, in terms of scale, right after um, Salesforce. Now, I know that because we ripped the hell out of Salesforce's website when we built our product. <laughs> um, but um, so, so when I came out of out of Hoster World and started doing some non-exec stuff, I started looking at some e-commerce companies, and I've always been in customer customer support. Yeah. And you know, in Hostel World, Hostel World is, is, if you don't know, you know, youth hostels are significantly cheaper than hotels. Yeah. You know, you might get 20 bucks a night. Uh, and so you've got to make sure the customer is happy, but that you don't have to spend an awful lot of time servicing them. Okay. Because you can't afford to answer the phone, not for a $20 a night reservation. So I had built a system within Hostel World, called, which we called Karma. And the idea was that we, if we had good karma, customers, good. Yeah. it was Karma with a K, K R M, as, our, as in our CRM system. And I was very conscious that we would service people really well and they would come back. And as a result of which, you know, we were sleeping, you know, 100,000 people every night wow. in countries around the world. So it, this was of significant scale. Yeah. And so when I looked at e-commerce, I saw a very divergent marketplace, one where people who would typically have started their own website and spent a lot of money marketing their own websites were starting to use platforms and paying significant commission, you know, 15, 20 percent. Uh, for a platform to sell the product, but they weren't necessarily on top of the cost of sale. So the guy I met, uh, my my buddy who had an e-commerce company, who was doing about a million bucks a month, he was he was selling a lot, but he didn't seem to be making a lot a lot of, of top line. The profit wasn't there at a company level. He wasn't making it. So mm -hmm. I was going, well, let me look inside, and I could see that he wasn't making it because he wasn't on top of his cost of sale very well. So he would have the cost of the product, but he didn't necessarily join all the dots. He didn't join the, the, the right fees tax. that were going on. Exactly. The right sales tax, the right fees, the right cost of set, the cost of delivery. Uh, and then he wasn't minding his reputation. So he would sell a lot of stuff. Stuff would come back. The handling of the, of the support wasn't great. His ratings would drop. And so, I mean, if you think of a pure Amazon level, if your ratings drop, the only other way you can win the buy box is by being really, really cheap. Right. Surrender a lot of margin. There's a lot of factors in the buy box. Let's not make not oversimplify it. But let's call the two big ones: price and reputation. Right. Okay. 
And that pretty much speaks to everything that is sold by the, either in store or online in the world. Right. Is it a good price and is the reputation good? If my reputation is crap, I have to drop my price if I'm going to sell a lot of it. Yeah. So he was in trouble. I went right, took a real deep dive into his data and started to realize that over 40% of the products, of the orders that he fulfilled, he was losing money on. That's on crazy. A, on a order by oh. order level. And so we set about writing a suite of tools. Uh, we wrote a, what we call our enterprise product, which we no longer sell, uh, because it was just so monstrous. And, and it took so long to implement. It was like you know a, a mega ERP system. Yeah. And I thought, gosh, this is, life is not worth living if you've got to sell this. <laughs> Right. So, so we could say I can make the most impact if I can help someone fix the price to be a price that makes them money. Yeah. Uh, and still gets them, you know, the buy box if 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 prices are important there, and importantly keeps their reputation high. So most things that we do are price and reputation related. So I make sure that your answers get out there, uh, that that you get response times well within the SLAs of the various platforms. That you know where you stand with them. That we that we monitor how your how your ratings are going. Yeah. We also make sure that your own customers get their get the off your own website. If you sell through Shopify, or if you sell through Magento, or you've got your own even your own custom store that you wrote, we can find ways to integrate with that so that your agents, be it yourself on your mobile phone on your cell phone, want to answer answer a query. Yeah, that we've got the data in front of you. So what were you doing at the time? Because you're not a person who sits around on the beach. What were you oh, doing while you were I, digging into his business? I nearly always have two businesses. It, right. Since I, I've never ever had a job, that kind of makes it hard for people to understand. So I've never had a CV. Um, I wrote I, I wrote software since since I was 16. I wrote a computer game, made some money on it, and kept going writing software. So um, at that time, I would have been chairman of Skyscanner, which, as you say, got sold for 1.7 billion dollars a few yeah. weeks ago. A few weeks uh, ago. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and I was also founding Ultimate Rugby, which is the biggest rugby app in the world. And um, and then I would have been also on the board of a company called Ding.com, which I'm still on the board of, which, which is something else, which is which is uh, international telephone credit. So yeah. Lots so of how do you manage your time between all those things? What's your what's your day like at that time when you were doing all yeah. that and digging into what was the the seeds of Excelco? Uh, what did your schedule look like? My schedule is pretty okay. I, so because I've never had a job, I don't understand work. Okay, and I've never had what I would call a job. Right. Even now, even though I turn up at this particular office for my work time, um, so I, you know, I I surf. That's that's my hobby. So when you do what you love, it's not work. So right? when do you usually wake up and when do you go to bed? Oh, I have a funny sleep pattern. So I I I wake at about two a.m about three or four days a week and I get up and mm -hmm. I work till about six mm. and I go back to bed and I get up around eight. So I sleep for two more hours and it's like I never got up. On the days I do this, it's like I never, except that four hours or two, three, four hour window between two, say two, three a.m. when I wake up and when I go back to bed at seven, six, seven, whatever, mm -hmm. and the most productive hours of my day. Um, but I don't have a, I mean, I'm usually in an office somewhere or, or having a meeting somewhere around 8 a.m. anyway, but, uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a bit messed up my schedule, but no, I like hearing I, this. It's interesting. And when you wake up at two and work till six, what time are you usually going to sleep? Um, I, would, uh, oh, I, I don't go to bed early. I could go to bed at like 11:30 PM and wake up two and a half hours later, do a few hours, sleep for a couple more hours get back up and be good as new. And it comes from a lot of jet lag and, and understanding when I, particularly in the formerly in the travel industry, you're traveling a lot. I was doing 60 countries a year, easy. Wow. And some of them, it's Asia. We had an office in Shanghai. We had an office in, in uh, Sydney, Australia. We had offices in, in Palo Alto. And I was traveling all the time. So I was always in some state of jet lag. But I did realize very quickly when I started to travel a lot that it, when you wake up, you get up. Because if you don't, you'll you'll lie awake and you'll think yourself into a state of depression that is, you know, insane. When in actual fact, there's nothing really wrong. It's just that you're awake and you're trying to force yourself to sleep. So you can't you cannot force yourself to sleep. So when I wake up, I get up. So you basically sleep maybe four to five hours a night, broken up into like two and a half hour chunks ish. Yeah, yeah. Let's not overdo it. You know what I mean? I I do that 
two, three, four days a week. Right. I don't set out to do it. I don't set an alarm. If I wake, I get up. Hmm. And um, invariably at the weekend, because I'm Irish, I'll have a couple of beers on a Friday or a Saturday. So I'm not going to up in those days. So <laughs> let's be clear. So, Ray, with Excelco, it seemed like that was a similar trend with, with Hostel World, where you came out with a product in the beginning and you were charging like ten or fifteen thousand dollars and you realize where the market was going mm -hmm. um, with the platform and charge less and it seems similar with with Excelco you started off with more of a mega product and so what after the mega product what was the first um, iteration that wasn't taking so long to implement and yeah that was a light product so 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 let's talk about the mega product which is still in the yeah. arsenal we have customers of it we just don't sell it anymore yeah. um, the, the mega product did everything okay and the problem with that is you're you're competing with SAP, you know, in terms of scale. Yeah. Uh, you're also competing in a world where not everybody has the cleanest data in the world. So there's a lot of data entry to be done. And if somebody makes a mistake and they were taking data from, let's say, another system, they're taking it via Excel. And there's a problem right. with Excel spreadsheet. The data going into our product is never right. clean, and right. there's a lot of like if someone's puts the wrong product of the cost of goods, then that will throw off everything their their whole profit. Or, or they put the a field one one field to the left because the computer doesn't know that you put it in the wrong box, you know. So, um, so the big product was huge. The implementation costs were huge, but we could see very quickly that that the winning facets of it were pricing and reputation. So we so the first thing we came out of it was we, we we cut out this repricing tool, excuse me, a repricing tool which is for Amazon sellers pretty much. Yeah. Exclusively, although we do now allow them allow you replicate your Amazon prices into eBay, which is working really well. Yeah. But the idea is, you know, with repricing, you know, you, you you have if you've got ten products that you sell online, yeah, you can watch the competitors and you can change the price and you can say, well, I, I'm prepared to sell at this price. But we have customers with three million SKUs, and and there's no way you're going to watch the comparative prices of three million SKUs. But equally, back to my friend back in the day, you got to make sure you're making money on these products. So. You know, we have levels of of, uh, of, of that product, and, and at the top end, you've got a product which we call net margin repricing, where we can you can put in the cost price, and you can put in you know where you go, not just at your floor price, but see all the facets of price. Yeah. Um, so that was the first thing we brought out. Uh, it's been hugely successful, and then we we brought out the uh, the help desk, uh, and that's been great because it it kind of but go to my story, price and reputation. It's the same. It, it's, it, it is business, right? Price and reputation. What's left? Yeah, right. Um, so you took the core pain points, the core what people need in their business, and basically separated those out into two distinct products. Yeah. Um, One of the products, I think there's a, there's a small, an asterisk beside reputation, which is how do I elicit uh, a better reputation? So let's say I produce... I be proactive great. about it. Yeah. So what we do is we have a product called High Five, I mean, the visualization is someone gives you a high five if you do a good job. And what we do is we allow you selectively approach customers through platforms. So yeah. you can say, I want everybody who bought a certain suite of products during a certain timeline. And I want to approach those people and ask them to rate my service. Yeah. And, and what that does is, by being selective, we might be able to exclude people who bought a certain product, which is maybe, maybe very complex. Maybe the manual wasn't great. Maybe it was just a bad product. Yeah. Okay, which isn't my fault as a seller because it, I'm not selling. I'm selling other people's products mostly, so I shouldn't really get a kick in if you like for that. So what <laughs> we do is we like exclude certain products right. from you, from your you know soliciting of, of reviews, right. and you know that means you tend to get more true reviews, and as, as such, you tend to get higher reviews. Yeah, yeah. So that's what our high five product does, which is which is part of the reputation suite. Yeah, I want to talk about starting the company because that's not an easy feat, and you also have an interesting perspective of bootstrapping versus raising money. Yeah, well, I mean, I have, I have a different one now. You do. So, well, tell uh, me, tell me now, and tell me then. No, no. I mean, I tell you, Dan. You know, in, in a world so it, so as a software guy, I was writing, you know, writing software, selling, selling quasi enterprise systems for ten and fifteen thousand dollars a copy, you know, back you know, back in, you know, nineteen ninety seven, ninety eight, and then we the web hits us and we decide, you know, we're gonna do hostile world and I take a product from one of my previous companies and we dress it up and we attach it to the web and we start to make some sales and life is good. Um, the problem with us in Hostel World, yes we raised hundred and fifty thousand dollars effectively. 
Um, but we couldn't have raised any money then because we, by the time we got up and running and we're doing real business, like that we could have raised money, it was 2000. And you're probably too young to remember 2000, but let me tell you, if you're in dot com, it wasn't a good time. It was a bust, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, so it was not only that it was dot com and that was a bad thing, we were also at the low, low end of dot com. We were at the place where nobody could imagine you could sell a hostel bed. The hostel, yeah. You know, because our product was so, and, and people were so used to a very high service level it, with bookings. So we took hostels, we can take hostels from some level of technology to the internet. We bypassed everything, including Excel. They, they went from a book, a, literally a, a calendar book that they had on their desk that had their reservations, right to the internet. Yeah. There was no stepping point in the middle. So, but the reason why we were bootstrapped was possibly because there wasn't a chance we could have raised any money. You know, so you had and, to you had to basically get customers first. Yeah, well, we yeah. need the chicken and the egg. You know, there's no point in saying you you know you can book a hostel in New York if you've only got one hostel on the site. So we needed to have sixty hostels in New York before we could we, before we could show you that we were hostel world that we right. that were worthy of you know being called the you know the oracle in terms of all the hostels in the world. So. That was then, and so now, you know, and I've been an investor, obviously, in, in a lot of startups. I, I, had, I was chairman of Storyful, which we sold to Rupert Murdoch to News International a couple of years ago, and, and I was the first investor in there. You know, nowadays, yeah, you can raise money, but I think that, you know, I, my mantra is, for, for startups that I deal with, is if in a perfect world, we'd all raise money every Friday. Okay. And that, the, the point being that your product is supposed to be getting better every week. And as such, you would raise money at a higher valuation every week. Now, that's not really practical, okay? So, but equally, I see startups raising way too much and giving away way too much too early. So, to raise periodically, maybe six monthly or less, but based on milestones that, of things that you've achieved. So, you right. say, look, I need to get six months further. And my, in six months' time, my product's going to be significantly better and I'm going to have real customers. That's a different mindset. When I'm, when I'm investing in that company, it's a different world to the one that came in with a PowerPoint or a beer mat. Right. So, you know, think that way, which is to raise as little as you possibly can. And, you know, you know it's, it's, it's a horrible. I've seen some desperate stories. I've, I've come across guys who, who owned like two and three points of the company when they were leaving, you know, at the end because they raised so often. And mm -hmm. it was just the timing of the raise. The, pro the company was never a bad company. They just raised at the wrong time and too much. So... You know, uh, it, when when it finished Hostel World, yeah, we owned, and we had sold. You know, I I sold I sold her twenty nine percent of Hostel World in two thousand three to a, a private equity firm. But even on the exit day, we owned seventy five percent of the business. Wow, on the day, you know. So it's 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 a question of managing your cap table and raising when you need to. Yeah. You know? So when you start Excelco, yeah. How do you it's, put the team together? Yeah, tell me. <laughs> well, it's different because now you know, you know, there's, there's, there are. I think that I think the terms are there are two commas in my net worth now. So, I, you're I in a different to, position. I don't have to raise money. Yeah. Um, but that means I can I can pick a great team and I can have you know, I mean I'm privileged in that I can I can I can get the guys to, that I that I know from from around and internationally who are great software guys, and great product guys, right. and great marketing guys, and so. It's different, but you know. Having said that, it's a business. It's not a charity, and it's not a, it's not an exercise in whistling away millions of dollars. So you know, we've been privileged to build a business which today, you know, well, when I say today, this month will break even. It will have three and a half thousand customers. It will have you know tens of thousands of users all using it every day. You know, we're in a great position to grow. This is not a. This is not a. You know, I, I, my first edict because I. You know, you mentioned I, I'm 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 the uh, CEO now, and I've been the sort of quasi executive chairman coming in yeah. practically every day anyway. So it seemed logical that I would eventually become the CEO. But my first edict is stop calling us a startup. We're a business, and we're yeah. not a startup. We're, we we function. We play like a business. We play to grow. And if that means startup, yeah, fine. And we're young. Does that mean startup? Yeah, fine. But you know we're, what we're really about doing is providing great service to our customers mm -hmm. and them knowing that we have been here. We're super well funded. We're going to. We're, we've got a range of tools we're going to bring out in the future, and you know we will. We will do what I think the single identifier in terms of the businesses that I've been involved in that have been successful is 
that we've tried to do good by our customers and great customers great make great businesses that's that's my one so yeah. if you can if you can make them happy they tend to reward you by loyalty and by spreading the good news so ray you know there's differences between you know entrepreneur ceo skill set wise and you've had to to do both throughout your career what skill sets have you had to improve on to be a better ceo and lead the company so so i mean i I didn't. I did anticipate many of your questions, but I, I'll give you the question that I think you you kind of alluding to, yeah. which, which would be, you know, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses, and why why would you what would you do differently? So first of all, I'm not a great hirer of ex very high level talent. I am not the guy who has been successful in hiring a great CTO in the past or a great CMO even in the past. But what I have done is I found VPs who I have brought over a period of time and made C-level people. Hmm. So I'm, I'm probably, because of my lack of ever having had a job or any training or any college mm -hmm. education, although I, w I was registered for college for quite a while, it was my attendance wasn't great. <laughs> uh, I did get to spend three weeks in, in Stanford uh, a couple of years ago, which was great. But I mean, fundamentally, I'm a seat of the pants guy. Yeah. I, I know what's, what I believe is right. I've, I've, what, I think someone wrote a great article about emotional intelligence. I'd be probably big on that. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I like so. this. I like your thoughts about this because in one of the your talks, you said in hostile world, I don't know if it was around the sale of it or whatever it was, that there was no big org chart, 120 people, and people just did shit. There was no org chart. When we first sold a piece of it to, to a private equity firm, they said, send us the org chart. There was, we had to run around and ask people who they reported to. Like, who would you feel you reported to? They, they knew I was the boss and I was the founder. But <laughs> it was just an amazing culture of doing things. Yeah. Even here in, in, in Excelco, we have meetings. Everybody pitches in. So there's no Chinese wall between the developers and the support people or right. the market. Like, at the end of the day, you know, everybody's in marketing. If, if you write a piece of software and it has a bug, that's bad marketing. <laughs> if you write software with a great feature, that's good marketing. If you, you know, if you, if you go give good customer support, that's good for the company. Right. So, you know, and, and, and so everybody kind of intermeshes and there's no, there's no culture of blame or, oh my God, right. it's wrong. So, um, yeah, that's, that's because most thing. people that occurs in companies, I would think most and there's chaos, right? In yours, there was people getting stuff done. So I'm wondering what you do to foster that culture of just doing things. I think it's empowerment. I think that in the absence and in, in a crazy word of hiring, I don't know where you're based, but I and I know, you know, you've got a big audience around the States. But let me tell you, if I wanted to hire a CTO tomorrow, I can't find one. If I want to hire a lead developer tomorrow, thankfully I'm, I'm loaded up with those guys, but I'm going to find a lot of trouble getting them, okay? So I have to empower people who are not great and nurture them, and that's at every level. So so someone who comes in to me and says, you know, I, I write great content, I could say to you, you know, there's a branding project coming up tomorrow, and I want you to go in and I want you to run that project. Hmm. And, and I'll say to them, look, you probably will get a B in doing the project. But you will you will be a far better person for having a go at something that you didn't think you could have a look at. Yeah. And so that's the kind of way I've always behaved. Which is I will spot what I call the lights are on. So the lights are on. That means this person's eyes are just yeah. shining bright, and they can do whatever. You could they spot want. talent. I think I, I I love that book Blink. I think I can Blink. shake your yeah, and I, and I can tell you whether you're ever going to work for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and so and 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 equally, if you do, I promise you. That I'm going to give you the opportunity to be the best you can be, mm -hmm. and, and 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 also that I won't let you down, which means that I also am going to work hard for you and for us and for the team. Yeah. And I think it, as long as you're not seeing as some sort of absentee CEO who doesn't pitch in every now and again at sort of a town hall type meetings and then go bury themselves in a corner office and never be seen. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, the old the old guy from was it Chrysler MBWA management by walking around. I visit <laughs> every, every office. In this building, yeah. I will drop in and say hi to every single day, mm -hmm. and it's and I'll just chat. And I'm not I'm not there to check that everybody's working. I'm just going, yeah, how are you doing? What's what's going on? And to keep your finger on the pulse of things. Yeah, but it's like it could be what's going on with the tag rugby team. It doesn't have to be what's going on with the business. It's just like you know, we're you know, I'm I my door is open. It's never closed uh, unless I'm in a meeting, which is rarely enough because I I kind of try to keep them short and sweet. 
you know. So empowerment, management by walking around. What else do you do to foster the culture of just people doing things? Because anyone in their company wants that type of culture of people not blaming and just yeah. executing. Yeah. So maybe, I mean, maybe it's it's sort of second nature to you, but I'm trying to yeah. figure so out anything else. We do, and, and I learned some of this from the great guys in Skyscanner, because, I mean, there was, a, there was a leader, Gareth Williams, CEO there. Uh, I tried to buy scanners, Skyscanner some time ago, and uh, way back when they were worth... Well, well, when I thought they were worth eight million, and they told me where to go, but um, <laughs> later asked me to be the chairman, so there was some good that came out of it. But um, his his approach to people who work from home, and we work in a very diverse environment with people from different countries coming here, coming in and out of Ireland, and into any offices we have around the world. And I think that to be able to say to someone who is from Hungary, who's working in Dublin, you know, go home, go to Hungary, work from home. Uh, visit your folks. Use your vacation time on a vacation, not on visiting your folks. So go there. Yeah, I know you're probably not going to get in, you know, eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. But you know what? When you're going to come home, you're going to be buzzing. You're going to get a great feel feedback from your family back at home to say you're in a great place and doing a great job. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have two weeks in Rome or in Greece or in wherever you want to be on a real vacation. And this sense of, you know, the box that you tick that you says you have to go home. Those kind of things, yeah. letting people... Work from where they so want. There's a certain work. amount of freedom. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's no, there's no certainly no. Um, I've never appreciated presenteeism. You know, if you're the last one to leave the office, that doesn't mean you're the best. It just means you're the guy who felt that he had to be there the longest. You know, so right. you know. Um, what, for for Excelco, what are some of the the high points and what are some of the low points? Whew. Well, high points is when we when. You know, you look at the numbers and you look at the something like, and I, I, I'm going to throw a number at you, but it's probably a guess. But uh, last time I checked, 37%, because about four months ago, 37% of the people who were using our reputation management, our, our help desk product, on, without being asked for, had written to say how great it was. Hmm. Wow. That is, you know, they talk about net promoter score. Yep. This was without us asking. This was people who, of their own volition, had written to say, just a little note to say, thanks, guys. We really like what you're doing. So that is off the charts. I mean, yep. as a software guy, so I'm a, so don't, I'm a programmer, okay? So I write software. I'm not some sort of guy who's parachuted in as well. I have a passion for writing great product. Right. If someone says my product's good, I'm going to love it, okay? Right. Um, now, the downside is, that one of our products, which we released uh, an upgrade to, you know, prior to Christmas, well, probably went out in November, was poor. The upgrade was poor. The, the QA was poor. It was a poor product. It wasn't our, it wasn't, it, it's called Reply Manager. It was a company that we bought and that we migrated the product to a new platform. We hadn't done the testing. It was poorly done. I wasn't, I'm going to say it wasn't me because I wasn't the CEO then, um, but it was poorly done. So we have spent an age and every single bit of resource for the last couple of months has been making sure that not only anyone who used it and felt bad, but anyone who took time to tell us that there was a, there was a feature missing. We took everything on board. And, and those are days that, you know, you're nearly in tears. You're going, my God, this baby that I have, someone, you know, to, by dint of really not going there. It was, it was a very eclectic product. And we thought we had all the features migrated and we left some that we didn't know even existed in the product because we, you know, we bought the company. This but, was an uh, acquisition. Yeah, but now it's, we, I had a meeting with about it this morning and it, it's, it's insanely good. It is the perfect product for a small to mid-size, either e-commerce or not, uh, message management business, which is, you know, am I getting all my info at or support at or sales at emails answer i'm like so this product takes all those incoming mails and or ebay and amazon stuff at a, at a lower level maybe than our than our core help desk product and it distributes them so it distributes the, the ones about the apple products to your apple guy it just it, it distributes the stuff that's in spanish to your spanish speaker it distributes that hmm. so, and it makes sure that everything gets answered um so you know we're delighted with it now i have to say uh, it's going to be Instead of it being sort of denigrated and sort of being seen as an also ran in our product suite, it's going to be a significant part right. of our product now. So, you know, you, you take the pain, you make it better, you, you resolve that this will never happen again. And, you know, with me at the helm, um, I can promise you that 
we're going to be a bit more careful about stuff going out. How <laughs> often do you actively seek acquisitions like that? Because um, I mean, now I mean, there's, that's a whole different ball game, right? You're running a company, the products, yeah. and now, yeah. I mean, obviously, the big companies they are acquiring companies. Yeah. How, how so does that that factor in? Not a, so let's call it. We're not a big company. We have ambitions to be a big company. Yeah. Uh, I will come across and have always so so in Hoster World, in any company I've been in, we've always looked to acquire small mm -hmm. companies that fit within our portfolio, mm -hmm. who have great talent or a great product or a great audience for another product that we have. So you know, we we look at a product and say, oh gosh, that's good. We could do a better job maybe, but they, they, the users of that product really could use our other products. So this, you know, that's where the synergies lie. Yeah. Um, but you know, we're far more about buying or building than buying. I've always been a builder. So this is not some sort of roll-up SaaS machine. Right. This is we write software machine. And if we can find good products that we can tidy up, improve the interface, make it look a bit newer, add, add features that make it work on mobile yeah. instead of you know, just on desktop, that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's what we're at. Yeah. Because you've always, it seems, from the research has may, have made calculated, methodical bets, but some big bets. Like, um, talk about the story where you went and you acquired or tried to acquire Hostel.com. That was, I consider, a, a pretty interesting bet, right? It's called betting the farm. <laughs> You have right. no money at all, and you make yeah. So so we we had no money at all. We could see. So I owned hostelworld.com, and we had hostel every country of the world. .com. So maybe two hundred websites, all of them with hostels specific to certain destinations, and, and obviously worldwide. And we thought the only threat that could only the only people who could take us now is if someone very well backed was to buy hostels.com. So on Christmas Eve in two thousand and probably two, I mailed a guy and I said, I will give you X for hostels.com. And if I don't complete on the transaction within six weeks, you can keep, I think it was $200,000. You originally had. offered him, him less though, right? Oh yeah. Originally he said a million. Then he wouldn't tell me the price. He wouldn't, he said, he said no to a million. He said no to a million. And then and then he said, I said, well, what do you want? And he says, I can't put a price on it. It's like, it's like, a, it's like a, a vintage car that I've restored. It just means so much to me. <laughs> I said, oh, Jesus, this is going to be hard. So, so eventually I picked a number out of the sky and I said $3.75 million. No justification, no multiplying earnings. There were no earnings, no multiplying traffic. There wasn't significant traffic. There weren't a significant number of hostels. He did have a hostel listing site. Um, but I had to make that call yeah. and it worked, you know, but I mean, I've bought I think and, you're, you're uh, understating it because you gave yourself a very short timeline to, to buy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and we had no money and it wasn't a time to borrow money to buy a dot com because it was very, still very dot com, you know, in terms of time. Right. time. So. We gave ourselves six weeks, and, and uh, I know in the States you work a little bit harder over Christmas, but let me tell you, the pubs are open here, and uh, that means the bankers go and, go and have a lot of beer. So we probably gave ourselves six weeks and didn't realize the banks would be closed for two and a half of those weeks, so we really had three. You know, It was hard. We did it on the night. We did it on the day. We said we'd do it. We, we met. We you, met raise, you had to raise $3.75 million. Yeah. On, Minus on a, 100000 Yeah, on a prayer. Yeah, yeah. It, See, it was interesting. When I first heard that, the caveat to the story, Ray, is that you sent him a large chunk of money and said, if we don't yeah. fulfill on this, you can keep that. Yeah, yeah. We sent him, I think it was, it was every penny. It was certainly maybe around $100,000. It was everything we had in the bank. So you had something to lose. It's not like, oh, we don't come up with it. No big deal. Yeah, like yeah. You, could have, you would have lost $100,000. If, so, so in business, you either have integrity or you have nothing. So my integrity says, yeah. this guy doesn't know me from Adam. I'm making a bid for his hostel, for his hostels.com. Right. He's got to have, I've got to show him that I've got skin in the game and that it means something for me to close on this deal. Right. And in that, in, in this particular time, it was by sending him pretty much everything we had and saying, you know, we're good for this. And so 
I regard my reputation personally, and as you probably would have felt the pain in my voice when I talk about us releasing a bad piece of software, thankfully it's fine now. This stuff matters to me. So I regard my reputation very carefully. And so I'm not going to do a dodgy deal. And that means I'm not going to shake someone's hand, right. promise them that something's going to be great and for it not to be great. So when I write software and when I talk about product with the guys who write the software, I think about the users and I try to say, this is going to be more tedious for them or this is going to save their, their lives. I mean, don't forget, as a software guy, my the reason I'm in software was to take pain out of people's lives. I'm, I'm 50, right? So, so when computers came out, everybody said they're going to save the world, right? And it's going to mean lots less work. And in actual fact, up to very recently, they just added to the pain. They were in, now the reply all button that means that everybody CCs everybody and replies everybody else just takes so much time out of everybody's day. And only now, we're really in a world where we're, we're seeing downtime. We're seeing time taken out of our day. And so when I write our, our help desk product, I genuinely believe that I'm taking 70% of the time it takes to answer a support query off someone's, off someone's pain list for the day. And so that's a great feeling, you know? So instead of having to, you know, in comes the email that's from John, I got to look up John. I can't find the blooming order. And then I got to check. Uh, maybe he booked it on Amazon. Maybe he got it on eBay. Maybe he got it, except that he's screaming. Okay. Now we've got the order. It's in front of you. When did he buy it? What did he buy? When was it delivered? Who signed for it? Let's see a picture of his house. Let's talk to the guy so we know. He knows Let's that. Let's drop a drone in and, and, yeah. <laughs> and a hologram and talk to him personally. Yeah. The, what's the, one of the craziest stories from the, the hostile world days? Because that oh. grew from a bootstrapped to a very large company. Yeah. Oof. I think, you know, th th when you're in travel at the scale we were in with, with the audience, which was very young, that we, we had, we had some pretty tough times in terms of, you know, terrorism tax. We had, really? You know, yeah. Wow. We, we, you know, when, you, when you see, you know, when you, uh, like, you know, 9-11, 9-11 crushed the, the travel industry, right? The online travel industry, when it was just nascent, it was really only beginning, you know, you realize. So we were on the first planes into the States. Wow. After 9-11, I was on the first plane and we had five of us go. I went, I can remember, I think I went to LA and San Fran. I had people go to Chicago and New York and I had other guys go to Miami and Dallas. And where else? Somebody what else, were they doing? What, what were they? They were talking to hostels and they were saying, you know, we will, we will do the best we can to get this stuff going, to get the kids traveling again. The beauty about being in a young travel industry is that People are, they're freer and they're more likely to go places and get back on the planes quicker, you know. And then we all met in Cancun in Mexico on the same trip for the, where there was a travel conference when nearly all the exhibitors had canceled. Wow. Except us. <laughs> and so we had the world. It's devastating. Hostels going, you know, who's going to fill our beds? Nobody's flying. You know, the places are empty. So. And, and we had time and again, the problem is, you know, you had London bombings, you had Madrid bombings, you had Bali bombings, you had um, the horrific earthquakes where, you know, and, and you're, you just have to fight and you have to do the best you can for your customers in those worlds, you know, when things right. are wrong. I mean, I mean, the customers being the properties or being the kids who are traveling, who are now lost or, you know, you got, we had horrific situations where people were looking for lost Jeez. women, you know, but we just did our best, you know? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So we, we, the thing was to meet the challenges. And, and while, you know, there's, there's thankfully less, less, mm -hmm. uh, less things go wrong in this industry, it's the same thing. You, you meet the challenges that the business throws up and you try to be the best you can. And, and that's, you know, those, those, that kind of integrity nearly always, you know, the karma police, which I firmly believe in, they let you away if you, if you try to solve <laughs> it. You know, people are going to have problems. It's software. Software doesn't always work. But as long as you, you know, endeavor to fix it within a timeline that's that's acceptable, yeah. people you break. Yeah. Particularly if you manage to add a feature in that they've not thought of or that they think that they have thought of that nobody else listened to. And we do listen because it's the customers that gave us half the ideas. It isn't Ray Nolan sitting up on a top of a mountain, comes down with 10 new things he's going to add to his product. It's what the customers say we should have. Yeah. You know? So what's as a, late as of late with Excelco? What, what feedback... 
What feedback have you implemented because of what they're saying and maybe not implemented because it wasn't, it's not a priority yet? Because you, you yeah. can't, you know, execute yeah, you everything. Have, so, so it is important. Look at, I mean, I think languages, the way we do languages is really taking shape now. So mm -hmm. historically, you know, you know, you could sell, I mean, in terms of internationally or even, you know, multilingually in terms of a high Spanish, Spanish speaking population in certain parts of the States, you want to, you want to support people in the language they're most, most comfortable using. So what we do is we, we allow people trade in markets they wouldn't normally trade into. So if I'm, if I've got, I've got an e-commerce store, uh, selling on Amazon UK and I said gosh I wouldn't mind selling in France but my French is terrible or so, or non-existent right yeah or non-existent well my French is actually not that bad so let's go to Germany right? so, <laughs> no German at all right, right. say buy beer bitter, which means three beers um, <laughs> tell you why that's a good one but um, the point being so but so what we do is we allow you trade in those markets and then we take we take your incoming support queries which come in in German yeah we translate them for you automatically mm -hmm. you can then answer in English and then we will translate it to German on the way back out. Yeah. Now, let me, let me be clear. I'm not personally translating it. And it is a machine translate. So it's not perfect. Right. But guess what? Most of the questions are, where is my Apple iPhone that didn't arrive? Right. Or is it available in blue? Right. They're the big questions that people ask. Okay. And so you can write beautifully translated template responses to the more frequently asked questions about your products. Yeah. That we can automatically fill in the, in the reply templates. Let's say, dear Ray, in French, you know, here's your, you know, here's the answer to your question. Yeah. So that's really cool. So we identify the incoming language. So even if I've sold something on, e on eBay in Germany, the person might write in English, in, in which case I don't want to translate it to anything yeah. else. So we identify the incoming language and we translate to the user's language. Um, so in terms of broadening international business and increasing prevalence of more channels and more international channels, I mean, Alibaba. You know, there, there's real opportunity in Asia. The question is, are people going to make the leap? And they're going to wonder, you know, how am I going to support a guy in Shanghai who buys my product? Well, you know, we can help with that uh, by translating the incoming algorithms. And yeah, it's not going to be perfect because you're not going to pay, you know, four dollars a page to have something translated every time someone writes to you. Right. But the questions are pretty much always the same. And yeah, sometimes. There'll be a difficult question that says, you know, where's the switch on my iPad Pro? And maybe you'll make a fist of it, but it's better than no answer. Right. You know? I mean, well, I like what you're saying. I mean, basically, you listen to the customers and fulfill on their pain points. Um, but you still are a visionary. What are some things that you felt were coming in and either it wasn't kind of where the vision, you didn't feel it fit into the vision of the product or you had to change what they're saying to create something what they really wanted. You know, they're yeah. saying one thing and yeah. they really want something else. It's like, you know, Henry Ford, everybody, yeah. they really, a fast fine. You know, you can have anything you want as long as it's black. I think that customers are not always great at explaining what they want. They can tell you what the pain is. And because yeah. their manifestation of the pain is this way, they describe it. And if you were to, transcribe what they've said and then implement it in software. It would work for them and for them only. The job of someone like me is to interpret the question right. and say, okay, how can I simplify this so that even if it goes 80% of the way for this guy, it doesn't clunk up the prospects or, or, or the process or the flow for everybody yeah. else. So I do like Jason Fried or Fried, I don't know if it's Fried or Fried, yeah, yeah. He, uh, the base camp guy. And you know, his, his, his thinking on, on, on writing software is pretty cool which is you've got to be a curator, like a curator of, a, of an art gallery. You know, you could not put a Van Gogh uh, beside a load of modernist paintings. It just would look silly. So you've got all the paintings in the world, but you leave some of them in the basement, but you only put the good ones out because now the gallery looks complete. You know, and that's when you're looking at a software feature, you've got to say, is this going to feel good in my product? And, and to be a curator means that sometimes you've got to say, no, this picture's not going to my gallery. Right. Or maybe you know, a version of it might fit if I, you know, do some, do some, is there a that. process for voting in or out those type of features? Is this a democracy? Is that what you're asking me? No, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not getting yeah, at anything not, in particular. I'm just wondering the yeah. process because, you know, people out there maybe don't have a process for taking in yeah. feedback. And so I'm wondering kind of what your process looks like. 
so we get it because because our because our support people and our onboarding people mm -hmm. are part of the product design process. They're not out in another building somewhere or or in India or anywhere else uh, bereft of communication with the rest of us. So where we have support people, they're very much part of the design process. So they're hearing from customers, this is pretty tedious. Uh, so and and we have a kind of a rule which is if the same question comes up five times, it's not it's not users, it's us. Right. We either make it easier or remove it, or at, at very worst, we write a really great helper video. We do a great helper video that says, this is how you do it. So yeah. if it's like something which we feel is rudimentary, but at the end of the day, it serves everybody's purpose. If you've got a video that's beside the button that will play to tell you what to do, it, then it stops you having to make a support call, so we save money, or we take out the process and we make it easier for you to do what we wanted you to do. Yeah. 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 It's a win for everybody. Yeah. Ray, people look at your track record and it's pretty remarkable with tons of successes. And I, I remember I listened to one of your talks and you say, you just keep kissing frogs and eventually meet a prince. What are yeah. some of those frogs along the way where you were maybe too early to market? Oh, oh my favorite one is the thing which I created back, which is called Passport Vault. And, and so there's a very unique problem, or was much more relevant back in the day, but backpackers. Backpackers would tend to go traveling and they would take a photocopy of their documentation. They'd have a photocopy of their passport, they'd have a photocopy of all their flight itineraries, they maybe have a photocopy of reservations they made in various things. Whatever. Yeah, and people still up. do that probably. Yeah. Maybe they do. Yeah. Uh, so my view was this is not good because inevitably that paper becomes used for something else. Maybe you're caught short in the jungle. Maybe your backpack goes on fire. But sure as eggs are eggs, when you need that piece of paper, it's not gonna be available to you. Okay? So my view was, and this is back in the day, so faxes were prevalent. We created a thing where you could go online and buy a bit of storage on our servers. And in fact, what we sent you then was a barcode, a cover page with a barcode. And what you did was, you went to a fax machine, you typed in our fax number, you put the barcode in, Bar, the header page in right. and you put all your other pages in after it and that sent it to our mm. cloud storage you're like Amazon S3 well wait till I tell you this is what's so funny about yeah. this so how many people bought the product we thought we'll do this and then when you're stuck and you're in Bali and you've lost everything you just log into this thing you can print out all that documentation you've got a copy of your passport you've got everything you need is there to be printed and we'll charge you like 20 bucks how many people bought it one my mother <laughs> Okay. We could not get people to understand it. Now, listen to what I just described. Yeah. I've just described secure document storage in the cloud. Right. So, did we know we had invented what would be the new way of doing things that I had invented this thing? No. Was it worth it? So, that's my other thing. So, keep kissing frogs. But also, there are no bad ideas, just bad timing. Okay? That was a phenomenal idea. I didn't I put it in the right context. And it wasn't in the cloud, it was in, on our servers. We had special dedicated storage. But the process was exactly as Google Storage or Box or any of these others, it is secure storage right. of files on the web. So anyway, no bad ideas, just bad timing. And, you some, know, have, that wasn't a bad idea. I'm sure some people have bad ideas, but yeah, that was not one. Yeah, but some of the, well, most, well, of course, <laughs> you know, I will always hope that my ideas were good, but just didn't work. I did launch a site called worky.com at a time when, you know, at the, at the peak of the recession. So there were no jobs and we just didn't, just didn't hack it. Recruitment's one, recruitment is an industry so ripe for disruption and so many people try it and never really make it. And I, yeah. I haven't yet, I've yet to see disruption, true disruption in recruitment. And you know what? I'm not going to be that guy. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not going to be that guy. You know, I mean, I think that, I think the problem with recruitment and disrupting it is we think that it's just data that you think that someone's LinkedIn profile or their CV or whatever is stored somewhere and searchable and I can now find all the you know PHP developers and so on but the, you forget that there are people at the far end of that piece of paper and they've got to be convinced to come and move yeah come leave their job come to your place and yeah. that's it's hard to disrupt emotion and what my wife says when I go home and tell her I want to move to this new startup when I've got a, you that's know, a to pretty easy life. predictable thing also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get you out of go. the house. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Ray, what are the advantages and disadvantages of being an Irish in Ireland, based in Ireland, entrepreneur? 
Or, yeah, you know what I mean? Well, I'll give you the Irish bit first. Yeah. Um, we talk. We're reasonably good talkers. We're, as a, as a nation, it's pretty well educated and reasonably gregarious. And we're pretty, much, pretty, pretty outgoing. We'll happily sit and have a beer with anybody. So, you know, I would always sort of pontificate that, you know, if you've got a choice of doing business with, let's say, a German guy or an Irish guy, you know, two things will it'll be very different. The German guy will deliver on time. The Irish guy will be late. But you probably enjoy being late with the Irish guy. Um, so it's, it's a different dynamic. Um, whereas, so that's being Irish. And doing business in is pretty cool because, first of all, we're the only English-speaking country that's a member of the EU. So we're the bridge for American countries, American companies coming in. So, you know, if you are a big e-tailer, you're probably best placed to do business in Europe out of Ireland because we're, we're the only English-speaking member of the EU because England are leaving, or Britain are leaving, and we have the Euro, which is not, not sterling, so it's one less pain point. Because doesn't Shopify have a lot of their customer service or some customer service based in Ireland? A lot of people, yeah, yeah. a lot of companies would have. Um, and, and obviously Google is huge here, Apple is huge here, Microsoft is huge here, and not for tax, for the fact that we were made to do this. The web was made to bring people from Ireland to the rest of the world, the, the ones that weren't going to get on planes, you know. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty... Do you pretty, find any disadvantages being in Ireland as opposed to maybe, you know, Silicon Valley or, or somewhere, some other location? Um, well, for sure, you know, I mean, I've, I've done some work in the Valley and, you know, in terms of fundraising and so on, it's a pretty, pretty, uh, it's not as adventurous an investment market if you were a startup over here. Um, but having said that, the upside is that when you make it, you probably own, own more of the equity in the company. So it's not a bad thing, you know, um, and, and yeah, there's not, a, there's not, a, it's not a very strong culture of tech. So we don't, we're not loaded up with, with, with developers, but thankfully Ireland is a place where a lot of Europeans want to come. So we have in this building, we have, in terms of diversity, we're about, I think we're 51, 49, uh, boys and girls. We have about 15% of the staff are Irish and the rest of them have come from hmm. all over. Europe. Really? Wow. All over. That's Europe. amazing. Yeah. So they, they come. It's a pretty cool place, and I think that if you're, you know, your culture is one that allows them to go home and lets them sort of be part of things. And we, you know, it means that you have to do different things. You know, culturally, we, we have a lot of team kind of sports that we sponsor yeah. the company. We try to get them to make sure they're mixing and so on. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's yeah, it's pretty fine. Right. So Ray, I appreciate your time, and I appreciate um, being able to research this because you have some fascinating. I encourage people to go out there and. Because we can only get a fraction of everything that you've done, but there's there's other talks out there. Um, I have one last question. I've been just dying to ask you the whole time. I'm going to ask it in a second, but um, tell people where they should check you out. They can go to xcellco.com, which is x s e l l c o dot com. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk. I mean, I would have gone in depth with Hostel World, Core Time, Sky Scanner. So there's so many worky. I mean, you name it. We we touch like a fraction of a fraction today but are there any other places we should point people towards to check out besides um excelco.com i think watch excelco excelco is a billion dollar company being made right now yeah yeah and so you know i genuinely i have never been as happy with where our product is and where our customers are and the sense that we're helping them as i am today so yeah, yeah. this is where i'm going to be yeah, I appreciate your time. And you could also check them out. I mean, they're going to be at the Prosper Show. They're at, I think I saw you guys at IRCE. You, yeah. you go to a bunch of the conferences. So if you see them at one of these conferences, go up, say hello, check them out. Um, so my last question, Ray, is um, you have nine toes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, toes. But, uh, but I did start with ten. So, okay. So I get my pedicure now. I look for a discount. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I used to play a lot of rugby, and, and if you know rugby, you and you can picture a scrum, which is where the, the bigger, slower guys get in the middle and cut into a huddle that, that hurts everybody. I'm the guy at the front getting getting pretty mashed up. But one of the features of, of rugby is a line-out where you throw a guy who's invariably, what's what's what, what's 20 stone, maybe 300 pounds, you throw him in the air and you, you keep him above your head. But <laughs> when he comes down, uh, he comes down on your foot. 
And so my toe, one of my second toe in was so mashed that it didn't look like a toe much anymore. Oh. So it had to go. It, this was over years of being stamped. They did. They cut it off. They just cut it off. So it's, it doesn't affect me in any way, but it's kind of an interesting thing. And But you also have the one of the world's biggest rugby apps. Yeah, yeah. I own ultimaterugby.com and, and the Ultimate Rugby app. So if you, if you like it, please, it's free. And it's my gift to the rugby world, which is uh, I really, really like it. And it's, you know, professional sportsmen are like entrepreneurs in many, many ways. And it's a privilege to hang out with them sometimes, which is just to see the level of dedication and how they think about winning and how they think about and how they play for each other. Maybe, you know, in some sports, not all, but, but certainly in rugby. In rugby, if you don't have everybody playing with you, yeah. someone's gone. So you feel like you maybe took that into your team and your companies? Uh, yeah, well, I hope so. I, th I think I'd like to think that we behave as a team. And, and while somebody has to be the leader of the team, they're just the leader. They're not, you know, I'm not always right. I'm just, I just say things. And I encourage people to say, you know, you'll get more respect from me. When you tell me I'm wrong, than when you say yes to what I told you. Right. Yeah. Everyone, check out XLCo.com. Ray, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you so much from Dublin. It's been great. Thank you yeah. so much. Good to talk. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.